Hi, my name is James Richard Floyds. I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm just finishing up my master's degree at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm finishing my master's degree in aerospace engineering. I did my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. Um, this is my audition video for the new show Breaking Point. Um, I'm going to go through the crushing the can experiment where I'm pretty much going to crush a can. Yeah. Okay, so what we have here is a five watt can on the stove with some water in it and I'm boiling the water so it creates pure steam and I'm going to pick this can up and I'm going to quench it in water. So I think we're almost ready to go here. Just gonna see if there's a... Yeah, I just shook it to see if there's any liquid left so we're gonna give this a dump. All right, oh wait, sorry, safety glasses. Safety first. All right, here we go. Woo. That was, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was pretty awesome. Completely fun. Okay, so next on the list to uh, play with is a bottle. Now you may be asking, what kind of idiot in the right mind is gonna heat up a bottle on a stove and throw it in water? Well, I'm a professional, so I think it's gonna work out okay. So once again, I'm gonna wait until there's nothing but pure steam in there, and if you look closely, you can see that basically all the water is boiled off. So that's pretty much all the water is done. So now we're going to uh, pick this guy up, and we're gonna throw out water, and we're gonna watch what's happening. What, what, what's gonna happen? So once again, safety glasses on. All right, here we go. Grab this ball tight, in we go. And, oh, look at that. Whoa, whoa, oh, Brett, oh, it almost got stuck at the bottom there, but look at that. All that water is stuck right up. That's also extremely cool. Okay, so just previously I did two pretty interesting experiments. I got a can to crush upon itself, and I got a bottle to suck up water. Now I'm going to explain this phenomena in uh, two ways. I'm going to start with kind of a more of a chemistry way, and then I'm going to go with a more of a kind of a physical explanation. But I'll start with the chemistry way. So when I was in high school, I learned the ideal gas law in chemistry, which is PV equals N R T. T is the temperature, P is the pressure, and V is the, v is the volume. N and R have to deal with basically the amount of stuff in the can or the stuff in the bottle, which is just the steam, and we're going to assume that it stays constant for the most part, which is a pretty good assumption. So we can write then P V is proportional to just temperature. Okay, so I heat that can up, I quench it in water, and what happened? In that first instant of time, temperature dropped. Okay, so this equation has to stay in balance, so what's going to happen? Well, in that first instant of time, the pressure will drop. Now, I'm going to draw a can here. This is a can. So I have P on the inside, and then I have P atmospheric, ATM, on the outside. When this pressure drops, it's going to be a lot less than the atmospheric pressure. Therefore, it's going to create a lot of force, a lot of stress on that can. So then, in the next little delta T, in the next little instant of time, the volume is going to change. The volume will go down because of all that pressure on the outside. And that is why we get the crushing of the can. This equation will hold true, pressure drops, sorry, temperature drops, pressure drops, volume drops. Okay, so I just tried to explain the uh, crushing the can experiment using kind of a chemistry, chemistry way, using the ideal gas law. Now I'm gonna use more of a energy-based approach, which I think is a little bit more intuitive. So energy is all around us. When you drive in your car, you have kinetic energy. When I take this orange and I put it on the ground, it has lost some potential energy. When I pick it up again, it has gained some potential energy. And whenever you move something, when there's a force involved, you're doing work. Like, there's some gravitational force pulling this down. And when I pick it up, I have to do work as I move it and I pick it up. So those are kind of like some things that are familiar to us. Moving a car, that's energy. Picking something up, that's energy. Heat energy. So I'm going to use these concepts to try to explain what happened in the crushing mechanics experiment. So just to review, force, or sorry, work is equal to force times distance. Okay? Now that is the units of joules, which is energy. Now initially when we had this can, okay, we had some steam in it, and that steam was hot. So it had some E T. Some, heat, some temperature based heat, right? So, what's going to happen when I quench that water? Quench, sorry, the can in water. A lot of that energy is going to dissipate, right? But how's it going to dissipate? Well, it turns out, as we saw, it dissipates that energy in the form of work done. So, all that heat energy went to work. 
and therefore it can crush, like it deformed, like it was work done. Now, you and I may be familiar with that in like, you know when you're a kid and you took a fork and bent it at the dinner table, like there's a force there and as you move it, you're doing work on that fork. So that's to me a very intuitive way of understanding what happened here. You had heat energy in the can and then it, all that energy went into doing work and crushing that can. Okay, so I just talked about how the heat energy of the can was transferred into work, like the work done to crush the can. So now I'm going to go and explain what happened with the ball situation. So like I previously talked about, there's all sorts of energy that exists in our everyday world. There's kinetic energy, like that has motion. There's also the potential energy associated that would associate with this orange when I throw it. When I throw it up, it has a certain amount of potential energy here, and that goes up and it gains potential energy, but then starts to fall back down and gets converted back into kinetic energy again. And this idea is um, kind of the same thing what's going on, it's kind of the same thing that's going on with the bottle. So once again, when we had this bottle, bottle, something like that, initially it had a lot of ET, some heat energy inside, right? So when we put the bottle in the water, we notice it didn't crush, right? So the work like there was no work done. That energy cannot be dissipated through crushing of some sort of can or some something like that. So the work had to be transferred to some other kind of kind of medium. Now I just talked about kinetic energy and I talked about potential energy. Now what actually did we see? We saw when I turned that bottle upside down, bottle upside down, the water gets sucked up. Here's all the water getting sucked up there. Now that water went up, just like this orange when I threw it up. It went up the water gained some potential energy. So instead of crushing the can, the bottle stayed solid, it did not shatter, and all that water was sucked up, and that's where the energy went. It went from heat energy to potential energy. Now, I didn't videotape this, but then I you know, let the bottle out, and all the water came rushing out. So what happened to that water that was sucked up in the bottle? Well, it was then converted into kinetic energy again. And like, that's one of the really interesting things about doing science and engineering, is you become very aware that energy is all around you and like everything we do in everyday life is an energy like is based on conservation and transfer and dissipation of energy. For example, when you drive your car and you haul on the brakes, you get all this kinetic energy, right? You haul on the brakes, and if you think you're the brakes on your bike, you can you know those brake shoes, well where does the energy you have, the kinetic energy go? Well it goes into heat, heat dissipation, like your brakes do some work, like you know, force the brake pads apply a force through a distance, and there's work done. Another example of energy, like similar to this can actually, is thinking your bumper in your car. Engineers spend a lot of time designing bumpers, believe it or not. Designing a, a bumper that can handle a little bump in a parking lot is a very challenging thing. Because a car has kinetic energy before it's going to hit your bumper. And what's the bumper designed to do? It's supposed to, to take away some of that kinetic energy so your head doesn't feel out when you, know, you get in a car accident. So the, a car will come along, hit a bumper, your bumper is designed to deform to take some of that kinetic energy that one car has with the you know, idiot driver and to harness that some of that energy so that energy is not transferred to you so your head doesn't get a big whack and the energy isn't transferred to you. I think that's pretty interesting and I, that's one of the reasons I love engineering is that you can describe the real world and really understand it. Okay, um, I hope you really enjoyed my uh, experiments I did here. Um, yeah, I really love math, science, engineering because it really gives you a lot of insight into the world around us. Like, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an absolute, no one's going to argue with that. Like, there's an absolute truth with that. And the more I have studied physics and engineering, the more I learn of these truths. And they're really, really fascinating. Like, they're, they're, like, you can't argue with them. Like, a plane flies based on physics. Like, it's not, oh, someone feels like a plane should fly, you know, like, it's an absolute truth. That's one of the main reasons I love engineering, and I'm pretty excited about this opportunity to go and maybe excite other people. And like, sure, we get to blow stuff up and break things, but we can all we can explain all those things with mathematics and engineering and the physics that I've been lucky enough to learn in university. So thanks very much for this wonderful opportunity. Once again, my name is James Richard Forbes. Um, hope to talk to you soon.